Whether you're here in person or watching online, welcome to this uh, service at St. Swithin's today. In response to the uh, knife attack at Bondi Junction yesterday, in which six people were killed uh, and the perpetrator shot dead, uh, the Archbishop has given us this prayer, which I shall pray if you would just bow your heads and join with me. Sovereign Lord and loving Heavenly Father, we grieve the loss of life through acts of violence in our city. Please comfort all those who grieve or who have been impacted by these events. We thank you for the police, ambulance and emergency medicine personnel who were first responders. We pray for the recovery of those who have been injured and those who continue to be distressed by these traumatic circumstances. Father, we're confused and distressed by violent and senseless acts in our city, all violent and senseless acts in our city. We cast our anxieties on you, knowing that you care for us. <clears throat> Please turn our hearts to your Son, that we may find our rest in him, and hasten the day when peace and justice reign. We pray in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> we meet in the name of Almighty God to praise and thank him for who he is and what he has done for us. To hear his word read and explained and to pray for others and for ourselves. And also today to share in the bread and the cup of Holy Communion. As we prepare ourselves for this, uh, let me lead us in prayer. Father God, by your power, please put out of our minds all churning thoughts and other distractions and grant each one of us a sense of your presence and your peace. Help us to keep our attention on you, on your love for us, and on your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The theme today is the Holy Spirit for us, person and personal. We read in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance in until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. The words of our first hymn, which is a prayer, are very powerful. Breathe on me, breath of God, fill me with life anew, that as you love, so I may love, and do what you would do. Our first hymn.
please sit or kneel to pray. <clears throat> Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy on us and write your law in our hearts by your Holy Spirit. The colleague for today. Almighty God, you have given your only Son to be for us both a sacrifice for sin and also an example of godly life. Give us grace that we may always thankfully receive the immeasurable benefit of his sacrifice and also daily endeavor to follow in the blessed steps of his most holy life, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forevermore. Amen. The first Bible reading is from John, chapter 15, beginning at verse 26. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me, and you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you. Thank you. 
But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is <coughs> love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Please stand as we say the Nicene Creed together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Good to be with you today. Let me, uh, let me begin by praying. Now, loving God, we ask that you would speak with each one of us now. Grant that by the work of your spirit, we might know your voice. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, when you want to pray, sometimes it feels like God is a long way away. I don't know if you've ever had that experience. We might wonder, aren't we just talking to the ceiling? Um, you know, is, is there someone who's listening? God might seem remote, mysterious, and very impersonal. Now, contrast that with... Another person who says, oh, no, I talk to God all the time as though he were my best friend, my closest confidant. They say they enjoy their relationship with God. They know him personally. They talk to him all the time. 
And so there's these two very different experiences of God. And I wonder to which of those you might relate to the most. Today and for the next three weeks, we are exploring the Bible's response to the idea that God is merely a far away and impersonal ruling force, a singular entity, all of the same, without any sense of personhood. You see, it turns out God is very much greater than that. He is nearer to us than the person sitting right next to you now. You might want to feel a little bit uncomfortable about that. It turns out that the God of the Bible is right with us so closely that he knows us through and through. And by the end of this new series, which we begin today, I'm praying that God will never, ever feel far away and remote again. We won't be fooled into imagining him as this impersonal, uncaring architect at the center of the universe. Instead, we'll be so glad that he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons in relationship, but just one God. And that we'll find that his Holy Spirit is for us and to us and in us and through us. Let me tell you a funny story. Uh, when I was in year 11 at high school, right after I failed my first ever physics exam, I decided to move seats from the back row, where all the cool kids were, and I decided to go and sit up in the very front desk where all of the science nerds sat. And uh, with, with my new friends, they would talk with each other in a different language, using equations and formulae with letters and numbers. F equals M A. A equals V minus U over T. E equals M C squared. I had no idea what they're talking about. You can imagine the look on my face with my new friends. Their words just seemed all like mumbo-jumbo. I had no idea. But then I actually started doing the homework. And uh, I, I even read the textbook. And the formula started to make sense. I say started to make sense. Force equals mass times acceleration. That was fine. E equals mc squared, I'm not really sure about yet. <laughs> now, why is that a funny story? Well, a few moments ago, when I said God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons in relationship, but just one God, when I said that, your faces looked like mine when I was sitting next to my new friends, talking in complicated equations and formulae. Now, we know these words about God and what they ordinarily mean. But when you put them into a formula like that, we kind of, we, it's true, but we glaze over. Uh, one plus one plus one equals one. Right? How does that work? It's true that God's Holy Spirit is for us, and He's to us, and He's in us, and He's through us. But instead of talking about theological formulae, today we're going to talk about real life. You'll be pleased to know. How do we actually experience God today? Especially now that Jesus is not with us, like he was, you know, with his first disciples. We, we actually want to talk about, for the next four weeks, our lived experience of being Christians and having God in our lives. You know, Jesus wanted to talk about exactly that on the night before he died. We, we're going to look at... John's Gospel, chapters 15 and 16. It's the Last Supper. Jesus is leaving and the disciples know he's leaving. And they are struggling to understand everything that Jesus is saying. But in the midst of all their turmoil, Jesus says this, When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. 
But now I'm going to him who sent me. None of you asks me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I've said these things. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So with Jesus no longer with his disciples, they will have this continuity of relationship with him through the advocate. And since we're in pretty much the same situation as those disciples in this after Jesus time, this advocate is similarly important for us. This advocate is the Holy Spirit of truth whom Jesus sent, he'll send from his father to his disciples. In short, Jesus is saying, look, the same relationship that you have enjoyed with him, that will be continued now through the advocate. He will be their master, their guide, their protector. Their relationship with Jesus is not coming to an end at all. It's only just beginning. And it's going to get even better. And so today, for the next three weeks as well, we are focusing on God, the Holy Spirit, the Advocate, the Spirit of Truth. And it's kind of hard for us to imagine how it could be better that the Holy Spirit would come when we'd maybe rather have... Wouldn't it be good to have Jesus? It'd be much better to have him preaching today with us. How good. But it is better... Because the resurrected Jesus was limited to being in one place at one time. Just a few Christians at a time. That would never work for Christians all across the world today. And yet, his omnipresent spirit, his Holy Spirit, has us all covered. He is everywhere, all the time. And he is accessible to every Christian, moment by moment. Looking a little further at this passage here, there's a few more things to notice. Do you see how casually Jesus talks about God as distinct persons? Jesus says he will send the Spirit from the Father. But he's got to go away first so that he will come. This advocate, this Spirit, is a person. Someone who comes. Elsewhere in the same passage, he speaks, he hears, he passes on the truth, and he guides into the truth. The Holy Spirit is a him, not an it. He is a person. He's not like an interface or an adapter. You know when you adapt those two cables together? Our advocate, our comforter, our counsellor, our helper is fundamentally relational in himself. And he speaks with and for us in our most important relationships. Notice Jesus isn't using any formulae here. There is, there is no equation about the Trinity distinguishing the three persons and their roles and their relationships with each other. And yet there's only one God... Instead, he just says, this is how it is. And so that approach might be enough for us today. This is who God is. What does that name, the advocate, mean? Literally, he's someone who comes alongside us and speaks on our behalf. You might know of various Bible translations where the word advocate is actually translated comforter or counsellor or helper. Each of those words trying to captivate and capture the essence of this funny old word, it's a Greek word, called paraclete. Para means beside and kletos, one who speaks. So the advocate is one who speaks from beside. He speaks for us. And he speaks to the world for us on our behalf. And he speaks to God for us, for our benefit. 
when we are unworthy, when we're incapable, when we are ignorant, he speaks as a person does. He is God for us. Let's think for a moment, first of all, about how the Spirit speaks to the world. You see, in all of their confusion, in the face of the world's attacks, the Spirit will advocate for the Christian. What will he say? Well, whenever the Spirit addresses the world, he primarily speaks about Jesus. So following on in John 16, when he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin because people do not believe in me. About righteousness because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. That word prove in verse 8 means to convince or to persuade or even to convict. In other words, look, the world is wrong about three things about Jesus and the Spirit is going to do his work. He's going to prove them wrong, first of all, about sin because they have not believed in Jesus. Their unbelief is sin, rendering them guilty before God. The Spirit is also going to show them wrong to be uh, wrong about righteousness. You see, the world thinks of Jesus as a sinner, a blasphemer who claimed to be God's son. But the Spirit is actually going to prove them wrong. When Jesus is resurrected and he goes to the Father, he will be vindicated and glorified as the righteous Son of God. So they're wrong about Jesus. And his righteousness. And the third part of the Spirit's argument with the world is he will show them that they are wrong about judgment. You know, the world was just about to judge Jesus guilty of blasphemy. The Jews would, would judge him guilty of blasphemy, and the Romans would judge him guilty of opposing Caesar. And the Spirit is going to prove them wrong. Instead, he will condemn the prince of the world who had been active through both Jews and the Romans. Well, that's all pretty technical. What does it actually mean? Do you know, it fundamentally changes our relationship with the world. You see, because the Spirit is our advocate, because he's doing his job, it's not our job to persuade or to convince or to convict, or to prove wrong those who don't believe in Jesus. That's the Spirit's job. We can relax. We don't need to be angry apologists. We still speak. Instead, we've got a different role, though. We testify. We tell what we know about Jesus. We are like witnesses in the court with the world on trial. The Spirit is the attorney and he addresses the jury. That's Jesus' point in uh, the end of chapter 15. When the advocate, another word for attorney, when he comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. So the Christian person is not silent. We testify. We speak what we know of Jesus. And we leave the persuading and the convincing and the convicting to the Spirit. See how that fundamentally changes our relationship with the unbelieving world around us. Now, I don't know for you whether that's a difficult person in your workplace or in your social world or even in your family. Whenever they mock or argue or accuse, what this means is we can speak calmly of what we know of Jesus and we pray and we trust 
that the Spirit will do his work of convincing and convicting. And so that our relationship with the world is actually now very different because of the Holy Spirit. Also, our relationship with God is very different. I want to say that without the Holy Spirit, our day-to-day -day relationship with God is nothing. He, the Spirit, He is air in our lungs, He's blood in our veins, He's essential. To explain what I, what I mean by this, did you notice what Paul said to the Galatians about the Spirit? Here's uh, Galatians 5. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. You see the verbs there? Commands, actually. Paul is using, he says, in our daily journey with God, we walk, we are led, we keep in step, we live. By the Spirit. The Spirit of God is our means by which we engage in relationship with God. He actually enables us to get rid of our old ways and he produces the evidence of his presence in our lives in love and joy and peace. And he does this by coming to us. On our own, you know, we've got no capacity, no ability to even relate with God. To participate in a friendship with him. And, and knowing this, it's as though God, in the person of the Spirit, if here's us and there's God, God said he needs help. And so he sent the Spirit around to be on our side of this relationship so that we are able to relate, to engage, to listen, to, to speak, to be in company with God. The Spirit acts for us so that we really do have a friendship with God. When we turn to address God in this new friendship, the Spirit actually speaks for us on our behalf, as it were, opening up communication we, when we are insufficient, when we are weak, or when we, we don't even know what to say. The Spirit, he enables us in that relationship. The big picture here of all that we're saying today is that God the Holy Spirit is a person who actually engages with us personally. He is God and he is with the Son and with the Father and he is for us. He's on our side as we relate with God. And so I want to encourage you this week to simply explore this truth. What's that going to look like for you? How will you become aware of God actually enabling you to relate to him? Here's an experiment. It's kind of an experiment. I know it's going to work. Try this. Set some time aside in your day where you won't be interrupted and then... Maybe you find a comfy chair, sit down and say, God, will you please allow me to become aware of what you are doing today? Will you speak with me? Sit quietly, and after a little while, open up your Bible and read back over the two passages that we've read today. Just quietly. You might want to jot down a couple of sentences of things that have strike you as interesting or unusual or I wish I knew what that meant. And then when you've got some little notes there, say, why don't you talk to God about that? God, these are the things that I'm, I'm wondering about from this passage. Do you know what? As you do that, that will be the beginning of the Spirit's work of building your relationship with God. There are many other ways that you might do that. Our dear sister Barb Dean gave many people in this church a little book called Jesus Calling. Why did she do that? Because she knew 
that this relationship with Jesus was now engaged with through the person of the Spirit at work in each one. So can I encourage you this week, take a little bit of time to draw near to God and see how the Spirit will shape your life. Let's conclude with a short prayer. Dear God, we thank you that you have sent your Holy Spirit and that he is for us. We ask that today and throughout this coming week we might increasingly become aware of the way that he opens up this friendship, this relationship with you. We, we want to know this. We want to experience this. And we pray that as we sit with you and your word, that you might indeed speak with each of us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our second hymn, Christ on Whom the Spirit Rested. Today we uphold in prayer all who serve as staff and volunteers in all the ministries here at St. Swithin's and also their families. And we pray especially for our choir, its director, Philip Linquist, and our organist, Peter Hamilton. 
as we bring to mind the member churches of the Kuringai Interchurch Group. Today we pray especially for St. Ives Uniting Church and their pastor, Richard Dulin. Further afield, we continue to pray for a cessation of hostilities between Israel and Hamas and its proxies and Russia and Ukraine. We pray for all those who have lost loved ones, homes and livelihoods in these devastating conflicts. As we yearn for people to come to Christ, we pray for all our mission partners working both here in Australia, in Wickham, local schools and Wollongong and overseas workers, for example, making digital Bibles available, St. Michael's School in Hyderabad and in the Middle East. And we pray especially for all local outreach and service activities directly involving our staff and volunteers in Pimble Public School with Chinese speaking migrants and with local families. <coughs> and now we pray for brothers and sisters in Christ in desperate need in the troubled nations of Burma, Turkey, the Middle East, and North and West Africa, especially South Sudan, Tunisia, the Central African Republic, Yemen, Iraq, <coughs> Syria, Zimbabwe, and Nigeria. Also, please pray for those millions of people who have been made refugees and displaced persons by war or by conflict and by famine. Inspire leaders of those countries and of freer nations with concern for peace and basic supplies. Nearer home we pray for the people in parts of Australia impacted by floods recently. We thank you that the floodwaters have quickly receded and we pray that homes and livelihoods will be quickly restored. Nearer home too we Hold up before you, dear God, the sick and the recovering, those facing surgery, and in silence we pause to bring to God people known to us. And we pray for those grieving. At this time we pray especially for Terry Dean and the Dean family and Annette and the Cousins family in their recent losses. <coughs> be to them a comfort in their grief and bear them up in their loss. All these things, Lord, we pray in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We continue in prayer. Blessed are you, Lord God our Father. Through your goodness we have gifts of time, skills and money to share to support this church, its missions and its efforts to welcome, nurture and serve those here and those around us. Accept and use all of our offerings for your glory and the service of your kingdom. Amen. Our next hymn, Spirit of Holiness.
Please be seated. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we who come to receive the Holy Communion of the body and blood of our Saviour Jesus Christ can come only because of his great love for us. Those who would eat the bread and drink the cup of the Lord must examine themselves and amend their lives. They must come with a penitent heart and steadfast faith. Above all, they must give thanks to God for his love toward us in Christ Jesus. You then, who truly and earnestly repent of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbours and intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God and walking in his holy ways, draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to strengthen and comfort you. But first... Let us make a humble confession of our sins to Almighty God. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all people, we acknowledge with shame the sins we have committed by thought, word and deed against your divine majesty, provoking most justly your wrath and indignation against us. We earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for all our misdoings. Have mercy on us, most merciful Father. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past and grant that from this time forward we may serve and please you in newness of life to the honour and glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all who with hearty repentance and true faith turn to him, have mercy on us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is indeed right and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Lord, Holy Father, mighty creator and eternal God. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with the whole company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Glory to you, O Lord Most High. Let us pray. We do not presume to come to your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies, we are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table. But you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. Hear us, merciful Father, and grant that we who receive these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, according to your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, that we may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he'd given you thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given you thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. I invite our communion service to uh, come forward now. And for those who are joining us online, I invite you to now take and eat your bread and drink your wine, remembering Christ's body was broken for you. 
Remember, Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful.
As our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are confident to say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Lord and Heavenly Father, we, your servants, entirely desire your fatherly goodness, mercifully to accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and to grant that by the merits and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and your whole church may receive forgiveness of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And although we are unworthy through our many sins to offer you any sacrifice, yet we pray that you will accept this, the duty and service we owe, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offences through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory are yours, Father Almighty, now and forever. Amen. And so we stand to sing the Gloria together. the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his son Jesus Christ our Lord and the blessing of God Almighty the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst us and remain with us always Amen go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ Amen I look forward to seeing you at morning tea this morning. Mm -hmm. 